So we're recording now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the sixth week of this cohort, which is amazing. You're already a month and a half through. And there have been a lot of uh, chatters in the Gitter, and we've had a lot of assignments as well, but we're going to start taking it slow uh, because this is the week where we will talk about how to develop your project. So to start with, we have a code of conduct and community participation guideline. If you experience or witness unacceptable behavior, please contact the organizers. That would be you, me, and Berenice. And if you want to report any issue regarding either of us, please email the other organizers individually. So one big announcement, our Zoom calls are now hosted by the SSI. Uh, SSI is Software Sustainability Institute. You and I and Andrew and a lot of mentors and experts are fellows. And we're very excited uh, to have Rachel, who's a community manager there. Rachel, can you quickly introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I am Rachel. I work for the Software Sustainability Institute and I um, help manage the fellowship program and the uh, collaborations workshop. So if you're interested in any of those things, feel free to get in touch. Definitely. Um, we really enjoy being part of that community. So we're starting with the open science. Uh, open science has a lot of aspects that we have discussed so far. Um, and in the next two weeks, starting this week, we will be discussing two separate parts of the project. First is the development and second is dissemination of your project. So this week we will be talking about iterative project management. We will talk about open so source software. We will also have a talk about open source hardware and open data. So now I'll give it to you who will be talking about project management skill. Okay, thank you, Malvika. Um, right, let me try and get my screen set up for sharing. Share, uh, desktop one, share. Okay, can you see my screen? Fantastic. Uh, so the first thing we're going to be talking about um, is uh, agile and iterative project management. And it helps if I'm on the first slide rather than this last one. Let's make that big. Okay, can you still see uh, the title screen? Yay, fantastic. Right, okay, so we're just going to talk a bit about some um, iterative um, project management uh, for your project, sorry, project management workflows for your project, uh, including ways to automate that. And we're going to talk a little bit about Agile, but we're not going to touch on it a whole lot. We're more going to take some of the spirit of Agile um, project methodology than actually teaching it because Agile itself, um, people tend to pay for days or weeks worth of courses for Agile project management. Uh, so this is me. You may have met me before. I'm part of Open Life Science. Um, and I, like I mentioned, I'll be talking about Agile. So that's actually got a sticky note background because anyone who has ever worked in a physical Agile software team will probably be familiar. There are post-it notes everywhere. It's a bit like the carpentries. <laughs> Um, so what is Agile beyond a uh, word in English that means nimble? So it started in 2001 um, as a bunch of people getting together. They all worked for corporate software houses um, and they were a bit frustrated with some of the ways that things were working. And they wrote a short manifesto about ways that they wanted things to get better. Um, and I'm not going to read all of this because some of this is very corporate and software-y, so most of us don't necessarily have customers and many of our projects may not be software. Um, but if you look in the middle of the big words, individuals and interactions over processes and tools was one of their core values. Um, another core value, I'll skip to the bottom of the large text ones, is responding to change over following a plan. Um, and perhaps the moral of the story that I'm trying to get to here is what they were favoring was flexibility and talking to people and interacting with people over really strict rule bound um, project management styles and behaviors. Um, or to explain a bit more what they were pushing back against when Agile was founded, um, on the left here we have the waterfall methodology, which is when someone is designing a software project, um, one way that you can do this is you gather requirements and then you move on to designing based on those requirements, you implement those requirements and then you verify that the thing that you have implemented works as according to the requirements in the original step. 
Um, one, one flaw with this is that you're usually verifying that it works based on the requirements and not necessarily based on what the customer wants. Um, and it's called waterfall because it's very rigid and you flow from one step and down to the next step and you can't go back. So if this was over a three year timeline, you might spend the first six months gathering requirements, two years designing and implementing, and then the final bit verifying and maintaining. Um, and part of the problem with this project, um, project man management methodology is that if you didn't do anything right at any point, like you misunderstood the requirements, you couldn't go back. There wasn't time left in the schedules and the behaviors. Um, and it meant that sometimes the thing that produced was very much to specifications, but not necessarily what anyone really wanted. Um, and so Agile it pushes back against that and says we need to be interacting with people all the time. We need to be doing things in small chunks and it needs to be iterative. So that's what the right hand diagram is here. So if you look at the gray uh, cubes, we have a backlog. These are items, these are things that need to be done. And you take off a small discrete chunk at any given time. Um, you work on that task, it might be a day or a week or a month's worth of tasks. But once that's done, you then release it. Um, and the idea is that at any given time, what you're releasing is actually um, a complete project with just a little bit more on each time. Um, and then you also, you get feedback from the people you're working with, whether that be a customer or in um, a non-software scenario, it's more likely to be perhaps your community or your peers. Um, and then you pull that back. And so when you've had feedback, you, you'll end up adding more items to your backlog. Um, and so it's a much more circular cycle. And it means that um, releases are shorter, smaller, um, but they tend to be what people want, uh, which tends to work much more nicely. Um, or to sum this up again, so whilst this was originally a software development methodology, it's also really, really good for project management in general. Uh, and the idea is you break your work up into really small chunks uh, rather than having a really fixed long timeline. Um, and I think given that many people um, in academia may be working in, on short term grants of a year or three years, um, I'm, again, you can see why perhaps having something iterative that you're constantly checking whether or not it was what you want over a certain time scale, it's, it's logical to work iteratively as well in um, scenarios where we may be working. So how might I want to use this in my project, you say? So I, I was really proud of this little image I found where it has a big chunk, the big egg full of smaller eggs, <laughs> just going for the idea that we have a large, um, a large milestone of some sort, but then you break it down into the smaller chunks and the smaller tasks that you might want to work on. Um, so in this case, we're calling a large chunk a milestone. So some main large goal that you might be wanting to work on, pick that milestone and start to break it down into tinier tasks. Um, and I would suggest try and get those tasks to be between one and two hours to no more than a day or two. Um, if it's going to be taking more than a day or two, there's a good chance that you can't estimate how long it's really going to take because it's comprised of so many different things that you might be forgetting some. And that it's always better to break it down into smaller tasks until you really can es estimate easily how long they're going to be. Um, and so I have a couple of real world examples of um, existing projects broken down into nice small tasks. Uh, so this is a project board on GitHub that has uh, broken down into releases. It's a roadmap, basically. And this is uh, where I work, by the way, into mine. Um, so it's a biological data warehouse, um, which is kind of irrelevant at this point. But what I did want to show was that on the left, we have um, Intermine 4.1.2. This was a release plan that we have. We set in January, and then we have a set of tasks. And you can see each of the tasks actually is complete because you can see the little um, exclamation mark with a check mark on the left. Um, and that one's actually already been released, which is why all those tasks are complete. And then the next one, we have it 4.1.3. In the next column, we have some tasks that we think we're going to release in February. Um, and as we get further into future, things get vaguer and vaguer. So into my 4.2.0, we say spring 2019. This is a very northern hemisphere centric. I do apologize. Um, but again, we, we're no longer at the point of months because we know that this is bigger. This is harder for us to estimate because it's further away. Um, and the final column on the right, which is kind of cut off into my 5.0. So far in the future, we haven't broken it down into many tasks and we haven't estimated when it will be yet. Um, so the closer something is, the more granular it should be, effectively. Um, or here is another example. This is the Binder Hub for the Turing Way. Uh, and one thing that I think is really nice um, in this one is that rather than having the releases like we had on the previous one for Intermine, we actually have a set of um, 
uh, that there's a flow where tasks can run through. So on the left, you have tasks that haven't been done yet in your to-do. In the middle, you have ones that we're currently working on. And then on the right, we have tasks that are already done. Um, and what's really nifty is that GitHub will actually um, take pay attention to the actions that you're taking in these tasks and it will automatically move them through the board. So um, tasks that are in to do that you begin work on will automatically move into pr in progress and when you close a task it'll automatically hop over into done. Uh, so it means that you have a really nice transparent roadmap for anyone that you, they can see what you're working on um, but it's actually not that much admin work because a lot of it is automated um, as a nice sufficient and easy workflow. Um, and then I've tried to create an example that is a bit more hands-on to something that everyone can maybe relate to. If you have a relatively young project, then you might be thinking about uh, a milestone for you might be how to prepare a website for my project. Um, and so I've broken that down into two possible tasks. One would be domain names. I want to get a domain name for my project. Uh, on the right hand, I have to create the content for my website. Um, and then since those are also kind of vague, I break those down further. So domain names, I say, let's agree on a domain name with my team members, purchase that domain name, and then set it up on GitHub, since we'll be using GitHub to host our website. Oops, I went far, too far. And on the right, I've uh, broken it down into ways to create content for my website. Um, and then in scenarios where the task was too vague, like write an about page, I've also broken it down to gather bios, emails, pictures. Um, so each time when the task looks larger, break it down to a smaller size. Um, and then I've also set up a demo project board on GitHub so that you can actually see some of the automation. So has that, uh, can you see my GitHub screen or is it still the slides? You can see GitHub. Fantastic. Okay, so these are the same tasks that I had shown in the slides. Um, and I closed this task earlier. I said we've already agreed on a domain name. We can click on that, you see, we thought, ah, oh, let's use openlifesci.org for our website. And we agreed on that. When I closed it, it automatically got moved into the done column. Uh, so let's say that now I have actually just purchased it and I think, well, that seems good. I'm gonna close it now so that I can, I'm just gonna move this thingy out of the way. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna close this issue since we've now purchased our domain name. Uh, so I've clicked on it. I'm gonna say, I purchased this. And now when I close and comment, if I go back to the board, um, you can see that that has automatically moved to the done column. Uh, so it, it becomes very effective and easy way to actually um, automate some of the task workflows that you've been working on when it's broken down very efficiently and cleanly like this. Um, and the other thing I will show, two more things. One is if you add tasks, uh, you can create issues on GitHub like normal. So these are just normal GitHub issues. So if I go to my issues here, you can see these are all my issues. And these are, for example, convert bios to markdown. It's exactly the same one as in here. And a bit further down. Oh no, it's not there. Haha. <laughs> okay, it can be. So I've clicked add cards on the top right and I can literally just drag that in and say that's still to do. Um, and you can also drag cards between these columns manually if there's some reason that uh, you feel like that's necessary as well. Um, and you can also see here there's a tracking bar up on the top left where there's the purple and the green. It gives us an idea which, which, how many tasks are done, how many are in progress and how many are still to do. Uh, so it's a nice effective way to actually manage your projects um, in a public and efficient way. Um, and that's as much of a demo as I will add now. Oh no, I'll add one more thing. So if something for some reason you don't want to make an issue, let's say it's it's not formal enough or it's not defined enough to make an issue clearly, you can just add quick to-do notes here. So let's say I want to add a contact, oh, I'm typing that wrong, there we go, add a contact page. And that's just using the plus on the top right, adding a note. Um, so you can see that is slightly different from the others. Where has it gone? There we go. So that's not actually an issue. Um, but th that means it doesn't appear on the issues if there's some reason I don't want it to. But then if I wanted to convert it to an issue, I could do so as well. And now it will appear here. So there should be seven in the issues now. Yeah. So it's a nice way to manage your tasks. Uh, so that's all I'll go into for this bit at the minute. If any of that interested you, um, I haven't touched all that much on Agile methodologies, but there are a lot of different things that you can learn. Uh, so one Agile methodology is Scrum. 
uh, this has a lot of ceremonies and um, a lot of formality, which seems ironic given that um, actually Agile talked a lot about not, not having processes. <laughs> uh, extreme programming is another Agile methodology. Kanban is actually the um, methodology where you saw those boards, the project boards where we are moving things from to do to done and so on. That is actually the Kanban methodology, um, but you can read more about that as well. Uh, we also have a link to interactive, interact, sorry, iterative interaction design. Um, so UX, user experience design, uh, tends to use a similar iter iterative looping back process. Um, so if you care about how people enjoy working on your project, it's definitely worth a bit of a read of that. I've added a few bits of um, the Agile glossary, some of the jargon they use. There's a lot of jargon in, um, in Agile. Um, I could probably have five or six slides comfortably just covering that, but those are some of the ones that you're most likely to encounter. Um, and Cyril Harriet, who's also a Software Sustainability Institute fellow, has an interesting project to get more Agile into academia. Uh, so there's an interesting blog post she's shared here. And finally, we have some more notes about GitHub project automation, if that's of interest to anyone. Uh, and I think that's me done. I hope I haven't talked too long. And do we have any questions? I'll stop sharing if I can remember how. Stop sharing. Ah, what are tasks and issues? Um, so, fair question, sorry. Um, so tasks and issues, basically um, in a software world, there would be considered something like a bug, for example, but basically it's literally um, any uh, broken down part of a, a project, a chunk that you might want to work on for something. So, so um, they're straightforward. I think in GitHub, you can just go to the issues tab on your repository and you could create an issue. And that literally can be any to do that you might wish to do, whether it's something to fix or a new feature, um, but one of those broken down smaller chunks that we were talking about. Uh, did that answer the question in a useful way? Excellent. Any other questions? It's also okay to unmute if that's easier. So while you're thinking about it, I think it's fair to remind you that we have a breakout session planned where you will have a chance to go back to what uh, you just said and take some time to apply this methodology in your own milestone. So if you come across some question in between this cohort call, uh, you will have a chance to get addressed those. Okay, uh, if there's any more questions, feel free to ping me or to ask in the document. Uh, Movika, I think you're introducing the next section. Yeah, so our next speaker or our next section is about open hardware. Uh, this is one of those open area where we don't really talk a lot about, but um, I had a chance to meet Julieta some time ago um, and she's been in the Mozilla community as well. And we are very excited that she's running a similar program as Open Life Science, but for open hardware uh, developer and leaders. And we are very excited to have her in this call and she will uh, introduce you to open hardware in general and uh, how this community is working. Thank you, Mavika. Hi, everyone. I'm trying to share my screen right now. Uh -huh. Okay. Did that work? Perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So yes, as Malvika was uh, introducing me, um, I'm part of the Open Hardware Leaders Program, which is a sibling of Open Life Science Program, also a fork of Mozilla Open Leaders. And what we try to do there is to support people that are developing open hardware projects that, as you will see during this presentation, are a lot. <laughs> so um, personally, I'm a PhD student. I, stu I study how the open science hardware movement can contribute to democratize science and technology, especially in the global south. And um, I have other hardware projects that if you want to, I can, you can contact me, I can tell you about. So just to start, uh, sorry, one second, there. So science, you know this better than anyone, but uh, also mostly in life science, but science demands tools. You can do anything if you, you can produce data if you have your tools, which are, uh, 
super wide variety of, of them, right? It's like analog tools, electronic tools, wet tools, as, as um, we are not only talking about um, electronics, which is the first image that appears there when we talk about open hardware. Um, but all the tools we use in the scientific process, in the, in the research process, we could say 99% today, they are closed. And when we say they are closed, we're talking about that the designs of the tools, the blueprints, the how-to of the tool is not available for anyone but the vendor. So this is like the equivalent of proprietary software, let's say. And this um, brings some problems for researchers and for society in general. So especially for, for researchers, one of the problems is that when you don't have access to the design of or to understand how your tool works, we call that is a black box. Um, it's complicated when you don't fully understand how the process of sample to data is performed. Um, this has some problems not only for the for the research and knowledge production process itself, but also, for example, when this equipment breaks down and you have to um, wait for the supplier to repair it and you have a big delay uh, waiting times for because you are probably not a big force to push for the vendor to come and repair your, your equipment. This is especially more difficult in countries where um, that are um, not far away from the from the factories or from the centers where these tools are produced. Another another um, pain, let's say, is that these tools are very difficult to customize. And usually in science, you want to customize your tools because you, if you are doing cutting edge research, then you know what you need, and it will be. Uh, it, it's the case of many researchers that they want to tweak their tools and it's very difficult for them because first of all, they have to reverse engineering what they already have, which implies open equipment, uh, trying to understand how it works. There's a lot of time that if they had the blueprints, this would be time saved. Another thing is that usually it's really expensive. And again, this is um, feeding the knowledge gap that we have between Global North and Global South countries. There is a lot of science production in Global North countries and there is not so much in Global South countries because it's mainly um, many, many factors, but one big factor is that people don't have access to equipment. Equipment is very expensive. So all these um, pains that are derived from having closed hardware are uh, a reality and is something that people have been addressing for a long time. But the good news, is that people make tools. And in the last 10 years, let's say, there, um, there has been a big wave of um, people all around the world building and building different kinds of artifacts, not only for science, artifacts in general. There are many factors for explaining this. Um, one of the most important factors is the 3D printing revolution, let's say, uh, because most of these artifacts are combinations of 3D printed parts and low cost electronics. So another factor is that electronics nowadays are quite accessible. And another important thing is that the arrival of boards, easy boards like Arduino, allowed um, not only researchers, but people in general, allowed the people to tweak electronics, to play with them, to, um, uh, as Yo was uh, mentioning, do an iterative process over electronics, improving the designs, trying. You don't have to be able to solder uh, in order to try things. So everything is becoming easier and people are just building stuff. So in this slide, you see some of the um, open hardware for science designs that I wanted to showcase. In general, the rule is that if you need it, probably someone has started experimenting with it and there is a design somewhere in the internet that you will be able to find. Um, so I'm showing there the AudioMoth. AudioMoth is um, an open device, open acoustics device that people use it for monitoring um, noises in the audible and non-audible spectrum. So it's a uh, uh, same to biologists working in conservation and ecology in general. Um, the other one is um, a very high-tech device, uh, which is an open AFM, an atomic force microscope. And this is developed by uh, EPFL at Lausanne, researchers working on a laboratory of nano and bio instrumentation. Again, they have been uh, dealing with uh, closed materials all the time and they work on developing instrumentation. So they wanted to 
they reverse engineered everything they could and they wanted to document it so people don't, go, don't have to go through that all over again every time. The third one, um, OpenDrop, is a microfluidics platform developed by Gaudi Labs. And um, the interesting um, part about this is that also the um, OpenDrop is part of a big set for bio open biology instrumentation developed by Gaudi Labs too. So you can go there to the link and, and check it. OpenFlexure is a, is a microscope that is being used right now to detect malaria very easily um, and in a very cheap way um, in Ghana and another, um, I think in Peru, coming soon. OpenQCM is a very precise scale uh, that again is open hardware. And Back Your Brains is a company that makes open hardware uh, neuroscience, neuroscience, uh, sorry, neuroscience experiments um, to teach neuroscience to kids at schools in a cheap and easy way. So all of these equipments, and these are just examples, are um, open science hardware tools that have some advantages over the proprietary ones. In general, and uh, this is um, not, um, oh, sorry, I was seeing the chat. <laughs> we use Backyard Tools in our brain read. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Backyard Tools is super, is super popular. It's super nice, too. So um, some, some characteristics of open hardware or why are people building stuff? In general, um, open hardware for science is more affordable than proprietary options. So. This doesn't mean that it's low cost because there is a um, big uh, preconception and misconception about open hardware that all open hardware is low cost, do it yourself, and therefore it's associated with less quality. And uh, it's, a, it's a common um, question that I get like from, from researchers saying, can I publish a paper in Nature using open science hardware? Well, yeah, you can. And there are like people are using open science hardware to publish. In, uh, in journals, but no problem at all. Um, this leads me to another important um, fact, and is that if we know how tools work, then we can talk about real reproducibility. So we um, usually try to push open hardware into open science uh, discussions, because for us, it's pretty important that in this whole reproducibility crisis, we talk about tools, right? If we know which are the tools that people are using, then we can, absolutely reproduce what they have done in their research. Another important thing as I was mentioning before is that this is repairable. So if this is why universities are seeing open hardware with good eyes right now, because if you have a, a fab lab, which is something common at university, and you have techie people there and you, your tool is open hardware, then maybe someone there can help you repair it and you have less delays and you have less waiting times for you to use the equipment again. And then there's the, the learning and fun. Lots of people develop tools because it's a lot of fun. And also because they can customize and tweak instruments a bit just to experiment with new things without this, this waiting times. Another um, benefit that is usually overlooked a bit uh, when, when we give talks for academics and researchers is that it's not, um, it's a big thing for people in the global south. It's a big thing when you have really small budgets to do your research and suddenly with the same money, instead of having one tool to do your analysis, you have 10. And we're talking of these orders of magnitude in terms of uh, reduction of costs. There, are, uh, there is research on this where people say there is a 90% reduction of cost in, in equipment. So it's not, it's not a small thing. So, um, there are lots of people doing open hardware for science, and I would say most of them now are gathered in a community called Global Open Science Hardware, or GOSH. This is a community which was created, like the first gathering was in 2016, then uh, they had a, we had another gathering in Chile in 2017, and China in 2018. There is the manifesto that you can check online, I will give you the links afterwards, but um, the idea of this is that there is a roadmap of the community and everything is very horizontal and discussed because it's a very diverse community. The idea is making open science hardware ubiquitous by 2025, which is a super ambitious goal, but we're not that far. So it, it's uh, something to, to take into account and there are lots of resources that you can use within this community. So what can you do if you think that you could benefit from using open science hardware or you want to learn more about it? 
So you can join the discussion in our forum. It's a very friendly space. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be expert in electronics at all. Most people are not. Most people here learn on the internet with peers. Um, you can document if you have a development on um, different platforms. Many people use, of course, uh, GitHub for software, but they also use it for uploading uh, designs of electronics and 3D printed parts. There are specific platforms for this that are now are more than ever. Uh, Docubricks is one, Kitspace is another. Some people do it in Open Science Framework too. You can follow Open Hardware Leaders, <coughs> sorry, which is our program for supporting people who are um, making Open Science Hardware in science and outside science. And there is also a journal that is managed by the community, the Journal of Open Hardware. And the uh, special thing about it also, be, besides being a community journal, of course, open access, is that we review um, the designs, which is not common, right? So you submit your source files and we take a look at them and we, we make sure that everything you have there is open and available to everyone. So some useful links, I leave them there. You have the links to the slides in the notes. Um, we have a collaborative list of resources for open hardware Feel in GitHub. Feel free please to, to edit and comment. Um, there is a lot coming for uh, open science hardware community in 2020 in terms of residencies and in terms of projects that are um, scaling a bit. And uh, feel free again to go to the GOSH forum and just drop your question or contact me directly. If you don't want to go to the forum, just send me a message on Twitter or send me an email. Totally open to it. So that's all from me, I think. I'll try to stop sharing this. Well, thanks, Olita. Thank you. Um, we have a question by Cass. Uh, others who have questions, please write that as well or um, ping on the chat. So the question okay. is 90% reduction of cost and equipment when hardware is open. Could you share the reference for this? Yes. So big reference for this is Joshua Pierce. Um, I will put it in the notes. Uh, Joshua Pierce is a researcher and very big advocate for uh, open science hardware. He's um, he has written a book, very famous book called The Open Source Lab. And, <clears throat> sorry, and um, he has some papers published on this uh, cost reduction that I, I will list them in the notes, I'll put the references. Sorry, most of the reduction is, is in the simple, um, for example, pipettes, uh, pipetting systems, things that are simple to, to make with a 3D printer and uh, he has made like the economic analysis of the cost reduction. Another, Hi. Uh, sorry, okay. one more thing that I forgot is that we have, and I put it in the notes, is we have a Sotero library for um, open hardware papers in general. Um, so you can check there, there are not only technical, um, but also socioeconomic analysis of open hardware uh, for science and not for science. Yeah. Yes, Christine, you have a question? Sure. Yeah, hi. I had a, a question because coming from like an open source software world, we find one of the major drivers of adopting open standards is um, not just like access to groups who wouldn't necessarily have the resources to pay for um, like proprietary formats, like in, in global health, in the third world, underdeveloped world, for example, and in like government organizations, open source is really important so that people don't get like kind of held hostage by companies or manufacturers. Um, is that also relevant in open source hardware and how much of that discussion is going on? That's super relevant. And in fact, when I mentioned that the GOSH community is very diverse, I, I said so because we are not only a group of people in academia, but also, um, people from com doing community science and people in academia in countries like mine, I'm from Argentina, where uh, you have really limited budgets for research. So it's a big, big thing. Um, what, what we are, uh, I mean, in my PhD, what I study is, is exactly this, how it's enabling in the in global South countries, how it's enabling research. And there are many examples. Um, there is, um, an example in Peru, researchers that had a limited budget to do um, research on malaria and how malaria moves with people. And they developed um, a GPS tracker 
and um, uh, tweaked it in order to do it open, to make it open and to add some things they wanted to, to customize. Um, mm -hmm. And they could, they could map uh, the whole Amazonia, right? They, they needed very specific, um, the Peruvian Amazonia. They, uh, they made very specific, they had very specific requirements, sorry, because they were working uh, in the forest, the Amazonian forest. So uh, the common trackers just didn't work there. So they just took an open source design uh, and tweaked it and opened it and released it. And now they are publishing with it and they are working with it. So okay. it's a very, very important thing for, for the community. Thank yeah. Thanks so much. I, I'll touch base with you later. I hope that's okay because I'm heading to yeah. Cuba to work on a PEG project for like exactly the same constraint reasons. <laughs> well, yeah. um, in the Open Hardware Leaders Program, we have three, two or three projects from Cuba because there are lots yeah. of open hardware there. Yeah. So exactly. Just contact me. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Sorry, I'm just looking for uh, linking the peers' um, economic analysis in the in the notes. Meanwhile, do we have more questions for Julieta? So, if not, uh, Julieta has uh, left her contact details on the notes, so you can reach out to her. And um, I assume she's going to be around for a bit as well in this call. Yeah. Sure. Thanks so much, Elita, for the wonderful talk. I'll try Thank to you. take some notes, but please go ahead and change if I miss something. Thank you. So I will now give the floor to you to introduce our next speaker. Okay, right. Our next speaker is uh, another Software Sustainability Institute fellow. I know we're talking about them a lot today, but <laughs> it's mostly because they're amazing. Uh, no, wait, I can't say that I am one. Um, Okay, I'm going to get out of this awkward spot and say, Andrew Stewart, you are here to talk about open source. Are you ready? <laughs> I think I'm ready. I'll just uh, set up my screen sharing. Um, okay, can everybody see that okay? We can see that. Um, should we yep. see it in present mode? Oh, yeah, there we go. It's in present it, yeah, mode. Yeah, that's just a bit of a lag there. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, I guess, the rise in open software in academic research that's really sort of transformed how we do research um, and has done so over the last few years. Um, so let's just sort of start by asking why, why would we want to use and promote open source software in the first place? And I guess partly it's a response to the so-called um, reproducibility replication crisis in the biomedical sciences where over the last decade or so there's been an increasing realization that much of the published literature findings can't actually be replicated by other people um, and it's caused a lot of problems particularly in psychology which is my area um, and in a sense recognizing that there's a crisis in terms of reproducibility and replication has encouraged people to go out there and look at um, various tools and new ways of doing research so that they can adopt that they might actually um, uh, re reduce the chances of these um, reproducibility problems occurring in the future. Um, and as an academic, I've seen huge changes over the last you know, four or five years alone. And I saw this really nice tweet um, about six months or so ago from somebody who had attended one of the um, Brain Hack summer schools, who, you know, was at a, um, is at a great um, research lab, which, you know, is kind of doing research, I guess, um, along the lines of how they've always done research. Uh, and in parallel to the kind of the traditional way of doing research, there's been this uh, explosion in the adoption of open computational tools. Uh, such as you know, coding languages such as Python and R, uh, Binder. Um, and the world in academia is kind of splitting into those people who are still stuck in their kind of closed systems way of doing things. And those younger academics are kind of really embracing the full range of open computational tools that are now available to them. And I guess this is partly in response to a lot of work that people like Brian Nusek uh, engaged with when he and colleagues established the Centre for Open Science, which puts at its centre, its mission, 
the idea that we need to be transparent in our research practices. And if we're transparent in our research practices, if we use software that other people can uh, reuse, uh, we're going to do a lot better in terms of populating the academic literature with journal articles that are likely to be reporting correct results rather than false positives. Uh, the uh, Centre for Open Sciences uh, had a huge role in terms of advocating the adoption of open research practices. Uh, they uh, were involved in developing the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines, which over 5,000 academic, academic journals have now, now signed up to, which kind of highlights the need for openness at all stages of the research cycle, including, importantly, at the level of disclosing requiring uh, and verifying shared code that's used in the analysis behind journal articles. I always like this um, uh, visualization developed by Roger Peng, which really highlights the full range um, of steps in the uh, research cycle that require uh, reproducibility, um, where ultimately linking your software, your data, and your computational environment is the gold standard in terms of engaging in fully uh, reproducible work. One of the risks of using closed code, these are a couple of examples you might have come across previously, is that uh, very often things can happen to your data because of the way the closed code is working that can fundamentally make your results non-reproducible. There was a case a few years ago of Microsoft Excel, which was automatically converting some genes to dates because it misidentified them as calendar dates uh, and ended up producing uh, kind of garbled um, you know, files that really, really lost the important information because of this. Um, but similarly, uh, a few years ago, at the height of the um, global financial crisis, uh, the US government uh, and a number of other governments, including the British government, decided to implement um, austerity and this was partly as a function of work that economists had carried out, showing that uh, austerity wasn't necessarily going to cause growth problems in the world. And a student was actually given, a, a, as his homework, the challenge of recreating these findings. Um, and he couldn't, so he emailed the uh, economists who were working on this um, project uh, and asked them for their data and code. And he found out that due to, due to coding errors, in Excel, they had actually uh, excluded some really important uh, subsets of the data, which if they had included, wouldn't have led them to adopting the same conclusion that they had done. So the risks behind closed code, whereas open code, open software, that allows for transparency in terms of what you're doing, in terms of your data processing pipeline, in terms of your modeling pipeline, etc. But crucially, it also allows others to be able to spot mistakes that might be cropping up a few months ago, there was this nice article in Ars Technica, which highlighted an issue with some um, computational software in chemistry, which actually worked slightly differently depending on the operating system that the script was running in, and it was to do with the way in which files were ordered. And there had been a number of papers published um, that you know had produced uh, you know arguably uh, less than perfect. Uh, uh, results on the basis of this problem, but because all the code was open, it meant that somebody could spot it, somebody could correct it, uh, and that problem won't persist in future. So that really focuses on, on the fact that, you know, when you're engaged in uh, using other people's open source software, creating your own, you're actually engaged with the community, which I think is something that's very important. There are more eyes than yours on your data and code when you go down the open route. In my own area of psycholinguistics, uh, the mixed models approach developed primarily for research in, in ecology has really had a massive influence over the last few years with the go-to package um, for mixed models analysis in R being the LME4 package. And what's nice about this example is that the LME4 package is updated uh, on a very regular basis to reflect the latest developments in statistical research and statistical modeling. So the kind of packages for doing your analysis um, published in an open way uh, allow uh, other researchers to update them and to contribute. So it means when you're building your statistical models, you really are using the latest knowledge the statisticians have about these kind of um, sort of model constructions. 
Whereas if you're using proprietary software such as SPSS, you're really using models that were developed probably quite a few years ago. And you're never quite sure under the hood what algorithms actually work and what's going on when the data, uh, when the results of the analysis are being generated. Um, we can also make our workflows open as well using um, you know, a standard workflow approach, um, which again allows and encourages others to look at the various stages of your workflow um, to kind of contribute to your code uh, and to help make it better. Ultimately, we want to publish uh, software and code that we're working on ourselves. There are a number of um, you know, really nice ways in which we can do that, uh, which up to a few years ago, just wasn't possible because traditional discipline specific journals rarely published open source software. So the journals, Journal of Open Research Software and Journal of Open Source Software are both great because they're very sort of developer friendly journals um, that make sure that uh, the software that you're publishing has had a expert eyes looking at it. You've got, um, it's being properly tested and whatnot. So when it goes out there in the world, it's kind of got, um, you know, a good, uh, sort of basis behind it in terms of um, uh, a set of a set of reviews. I'm going to just mention Binder very very briefly. Uh, I know I'm kind of running out of time. Binder is a really nice way of actually doing the Roger Pang sort of gold standard reproducible research by bundling your data, your code, and your computational environment all together to allow others to basically uh, run your analysis. Um, as it would be conferred on, on the date that you actually carried it out. There's a link here to a nice talk by JJ Hilaire from the R Studio conference a few weeks ago, which uh, I think you might find interesting to watch later. Finally, uh, it's really important to make your software, if you're developing software and code yourself, to make it citable. And you can do that probably uh, most easily with uh, Zenodo and GitHub as the node allows your GitHub repository to get a DOI. And if it's got a DOI, it's citable by others, and it can also be picked up by Google Scholar. Uh, Figshare is another option as well, uh, where you can actually have different releases on GitHub um, kind of captured within, within Figshare. Um, it's really important when you're using other people's open source software that you cite it. Um, it's important for reproducibility reasons. You need to know uh, you need to tell people what versions of different packages you were using to do your analysis. There have been some changes in the context of R and uh, the way that some of the uh, sample functions worked, which means that R 3.6 doesn't work uh, in the same way that R uh, 3.5 or 3.4 uh, did because of the um, randomization uh, procedures. And ultimately, you would never um, use somebody else's research findings without citing the paper in which the findings occurred. So obviously, we wouldn't want to be reusing somebody else's software without citing it too. Uh, for better and worse, uh, researchers and RSAs are often measured in academia by their citation count. So we need to recognize the software that people are developing as well. Um, and finally, I just wanted to finish by giving a bit of a sort of um, shout out to the cheering way which is a phenomenal handbook. I know lots of people sort of in this call have been involved in it, uh, and it's a good handbook covering, covering the full range of reproducibility, um, not just open software, uh, but open data and everything else. Okay, I think that's me. Amazing, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I'll just hop over to the document and check if we have any questions. Yeah. Okay, yeah, feel free to add question in, if, questions in if you have one. Uh, I can see a few are being typed. Um, I will just, while those are being typed out, I yeah. wanted to add a um, uh, comment that actually what I was striking and I was on the picket lines um, last week. I was chatting with someone and I explained that I was an open source software engineer and she said, oh, you know, I just spent lots of money on this code and it didn't produce the right, right results. <laughs> and when I contacted them, I said, oh yeah, that's a known bug. And she's like, what can I do about that? I'm like, not much. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it was open, then yeah, you could do plenty, but <laughs> I, just, I, it's really funny. That's fantastic. Actually, now seeing sort of, you know, bugs being fixed within, you know, a matter of hours for, on some packages that have I, that I've used in R. So it's a very, very responsive community as well. Amazing. 
Okay, uh, so I have a question. Does does open mean reproducible and vice versa? Oh, that's a good one. Um, uh, open helps with reproducibility. I guess, I guess, I guess, I mean, I guess closed software could be reproducible if you knew exactly what versions of the packages people were using and everything else, but it wouldn't be reproducible by everybody. It would be only reproducible by people who had exactly the same uh, set up, I guess, as the, as the person who carried out the original research. Um, and reproducibility requires, um, you know, openness, I guess, at many, at many stages of the, uh, of the research process. Hi, uh, this is a great presentation. Um, but just to say that there's also additional structures so you can, like, wrap your open source software in open containers to make that reproducible. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. Like, there's meta layers in terms of making open reproducibility a thing. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So one of my challenges is trying to convince my academic colleague, who may be a little bit more senior than I am, to change the way in which they do their research. Um, and I guess that's one reason why I like Binder so much, because you know, under the hood, it's, you know, it's Docker, but they don't need to worry. Um, about any about any of that, um, but I think but I think it's I think there's a real computational skills gap um, that's you know potentially in some places only getting wider um, because of the range of amazing tools that have developed over the last few years that really aren't having the impact that they should be in academia because I worry slightly that it's, uh, different aspects of academia are focused on the wrong sorts of things in terms of you know publisher parish culture, you know, big grants and everything else, rather than focusing on doing, you know, research properly. And I think it's particularly interesting to see that the Wellcome Trust in the UK have launched an initiative recently on reimagining research to actually look back and, you know, think, are we actually doing research the right sort of way? So there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, momentum, I think, behind, um, you know, telling and encouraging people to adopt these sorts of new tools. Okay, reciting software for RSC evaluation. Is there any way? Uh, someone's highlighted it, I couldn't read it. <laughs> Is there any way of counting citation software, such as the Zenodo software publications? Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's on, um, if it can be, yeah, it can be picked up by Google Scholar with a DOI. Um, so you can count the citations that way. Although it does require other people to actually use that DOI when they when they cite your own software, but Google Scholar will end up picking it picking it up. Um, I mean, when I review, you know, journal articles now for mainstream psychology journals, um, I basically ask every uh, of all of the key packages to be properly cited. Um, you know, as as any other you know research output would be cited. Uh, and I think action editors and reviewers and associate editors need to do a better job of actually. Uh, making sure that this that this happens, so citations do actually exist out there, so they can be counted, they can be captured. I was muted there. Uh, any other final questions? Or um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, with these new like Journal of um, Open Source Software and things like that, uh, actually reviewing um, software associated with re research is really important, but it can take a lot of time, especially because stuff doesn't always work out of the box. And so reviewing journal articles in general is oftentimes kind of like unpaid work or service work. Um, how are we going to kind of find funding and resources and stuff to add on this extra work of reviewing people's software? So I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and the way I do it is that I've started saying no to other things, um, other activities that I've decided for me aren't as important uh, as the activity centered around open research. Um, but it's difficult saying no uh, to your line manager and to your, your peers out there. Can I actually hop in and throw a comment? Um just about JOS. So um, I edited for a few months for the General of Open Source Software. 
Um, and one thing that I found was amazing was that if um, open source software was um, really good quality, like if it already had the tests, if it already had documentation, things like that, it would often take a couple of days maximum for the whole review process from paper submission to acceptance. Um, obviously, if the software was less good, that was gonna be, it was going to take longer, but it, it, um, Jot provides these uh, checklists that makes the review incredibly straightforward. Um, so I would definitely encourage taking a look and even signing up for the review poll. Thank you. Okay, I think we should move on. It's been amazing. We've had loads of questions and great discussions. Um, we do have a breakout room that Movika is going to introduce. Yeah, so I feel like we have already bombarded you with a lot of information and there's like chances that you want to talk about uh, this to each other and also like find a relevance of these topics into your own work, starting from the topic that you introduced and the aspects that Andrew and Julieta talked about. So I would like you to now I'd like to send you now into a breakout room to discuss iterative project management and design for your own project. Uh, one thing that you can start thinking about is that you have a roadmap where you have come, come up with milestones for your project. Please select one milestone, which could be the smallest one at this point, uh, and think about how you can break them down into smaller tasks. You can start by even thinking about what is the minimum viable product that this milestone will create for you and how you can go about designing this. Um, Again, if you need our help, if you think that this is a little bit confusing, call us into the breakout room and we'll be happy to uh, help you there. Uh, before we go into breakout room, do we have question about this particular exercise? Okay, so for the first five minutes, take your own time, pick one of your milestone, start breaking them down and bounce your idea across into the room. And in the second five minutes, you will share your process and your thought. Um, you're, are we ready? I think we are. I'm going to send people into rooms. Um, remember that you can always ask for help if there's any questions that you might need and go. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, can we do some silent Google docking on uh, just below the breakout room? What you found interesting about the process and what was challenging? And of course, two plus one plus thousand um, to whatever idea that resonates with you. Oh, I am looking at a lot of challenges. So these challenges are very, very good because you will have an assignment for this week to spend more time in doing this. So this was a tester for you of uh, how this process is. Did this, did this seem interesting? Did it seem like something that you would use in your project planning and designing? Yeah. Okay, you can I ask some of the questions from the challenging with you? Is it really worth to break out break down long term milestones? Are you asking me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say the long, the really long term ones that you're not addressing anytime soon. I would say probably not because by the time you get to them, they may have changed. Um, and when when it becomes realistic that you're going to be tackling them, is the time I would start breaking down the the distant ones. 
So is it fair to say that let's do the immediate immediate task sooner and then yeah. think about the future plans? I would say the, one, the ones that are closest to you break down sooner, the ones that are medium term, you maybe want to start breaking down to smaller chunks, but not to tiny chunks and the long term ones, just leave them. <laughs> Is there any more question that you would uh, like to ask or verbalize in, in the group for everyone? Hi, sorry, I'm having trouble with the Google Doc, but um, I just wanted to say that it sounded like recapping what a minimum viable product is would be helpful, especially in the context of like iterative planning. Um, yeah, for people who might not have backgrounds in software, for example. That's a really great point. Thank you, Christine. Um, so I would say a minimum viable product, the idea that it comes as a business related term usually, um, again, but the idea is that you think, um, I don't want to launch this massive perfect thing that changes 73 colors and has, has 100,000 features. You think, I want to launch something reasonably small, complete, but reasonably small. Um, so if we go back to the website example, for example, um, so if I'm designing my own website, the first thing I'm going to make is my homepage. Later on, I might want to have my about page and I might want to have contact us and I have the syllabus for open life science. But first of all, I want to have a tiny, complete, but useful thing. Um, and that's what the minimum viable project product, product is, something that's useful for others uh, that we can then add small iterations to. So th this idea is also quite useful in bioinformatics because uh, you always start with the project for which you know the outcome and you know that you've got let's say three years of phd or one year of postdoc to do it so you would want to work on something that is immediately uh, useful for you to gather feedback from people and then you start working on those features so starting with something where you can gather most feedback at the planning and developing phase is very very important and this is why we are using this term and as uh, you correctly pointed out, it's, it's, it comes from business and we don't need to go in the exact definition of uh, the minimum viable product uh, in terms of business, but we should think about how is it useful for your community and what are the things that you want to create that is, that is going to make you feel accomplished. Okay, um, I think we should probably move on so we don't overrun. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so we have one final speaker um, on open data today. So uh, Lily Winfrey has kindly joined from very, very early uh, in her time zone. Uh, she's from the Open Knowledge Foundation and we'll be talking about open data. Are you ready, Lily? Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for having me and thanks for setting up this call. And I am sad that I had to join the call late because it sounds like I missed some really interesting talks. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Zoom's making me call it, but it's okay. Hold on, I apologize. It might take me a minute. Okay, it's gonna kick me off of Zoom, but I will be right back. I apologize. No worries. <laughs> Can I just shout out Malvika's amazing note taking skills? I've just been watching that document grow and grow during the, during the talks and it is amazing. <laughs> um, Welcome back. Thank you. So sorry. Okay. Yay. Can everyone hear me? We can. All right. So I'm going to start presenting. And these slides are linked and there are links in the slides. So um, it'd be helpful to have them later. All right, so as you said, I am Lily and I am from the Open Knowledge Foundation. My background is in neuroscience research, but now I work with open data and I've been working with open data for the past about four years. Um, and so today I'll be telling you about open data and specifically focused on life sciences. 
All right, so first of all, what is open data? Um, I'm showing you the open definition, which was generated by the Open Knowledge Foundation. And it says, open data and content can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone for any purpose. And this is a very broad definition, but basically it's that information is available for people to use. And today I'm going to very quickly tell you about a lot of things about open data. We'll start with FAIR data and then move on to data licensing and then data management plans or DMPs and then publishing your data and we'll end with a quick example. And again, this is quick. So I'm just trying to give you a little taste of different parts of open data. So um, hopefully we can ask lots of questions. All right, so why will, are we talking about open data? Why should you make your data open? And one of the answers is to make your data more fair. And if you haven't heard of fair before, it's really big in science right now. It stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And these are, this acronym um, represents ways that you can make your data more open and more usable by yourself and by your colleagues. And there are two links here. They go into more detail about what are called the FAIR principles. Um, so first is Force 11, which is where FAIR was originated. And then also an article here that is really helpful telling you how you can make your data more FAIR. All right, I told you we're going fast. So now we're switching to data licensing and we're gonna talk about how it's very complicated. Okay. I like talking about data licensing and first asking who owns your data? And this is a long quote, but I'm gonna read it. Although graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and even some faculty in academia performing research may believe that they own the data they collected, they are wrong. As employees of the university, they're working for hire for the university, which in most cases owns the rights to the data. In federally sponsored research, the university owns the data but allows the principal investigator on the grant to be the steward of the data. The PI takes responsibility for the collection, recording, storage, retention, and disposal of the data. When data are published, the copyright is retained by the PI who then assigns it to the publisher of the journal. So this is a lot of information and most of the information here is accurate for specific instances, but it is not universally true depending on the researcher or the data collector's um, perspective or their environment. Um, things that I highlight that the idea that the university owns the data, but that the PI or the creator of the data is the steward, you know, has to take care of it. And then also that the PI might have the copyright, but when they publish the data, they give that copyright to the publisher of the journal which does happen a lot of the time, but does not have to happen. So I just want you to remember that, that when you publish data, you can work with the publisher, you know, journal or otherwise, to discuss the copyright. You do not automatically have to give the copyright of your data. So basically, who owns your data? It depends, and it's complicated. And if you're really, really worried about this, then you might even need to talk to a lawyer. All right, the next question about data licensing is, can data be copyrighted? And again, I'm gonna read this quote. Why is copyright such a complicated issue for research data? Because facts are not copyrightable, but works of authorship are. And research data consists of one or the other or some combination, and often there's room to argue about which. And this is from the University of California Curation Center, which has a lot of really good resources about research data. So it's UC3, and I really recommend checking out the resources more. Okay, again, so data licensing is complicated, and facts are not copyrightable. People often say data is not copyrightable, but then when you think about how someone uses the data, it might be copyrightable. So again, there's a lot of, um, legal gray area here. But how can you help make this area more defined? You can license your data. And when you're starting to look at licensing your data, I really <clears throat> suggest that you research your options. 
And these are some questions that I suggest you ask when you start thinking about data licensing. Uh, the first is, what do you want to be able to do with the data? Or what do you want others to be able to do with the data? Do you want to just distribute the data? Or do you want people to remix, be able to like build upon and change that data? Um, do you want them to use the data? Simply, you know, be able to access it? Or do you want them to be able to build upon and like build something new based off of the data? And then you want to also ask who can use this data? Can anyone use it? Or do you want it to be like only non-commercial, you know, only researchers or only nonprofit use? And then the final question is, do you want to be attributed for creating the data? Like, do you want people to say, you know, yo created this data? And here's one example of a license that um, talks about all three of these questions. This is a CC BY 4.0 license, which is a Creative Commons license. And it's a very popular license. You will probably come across it. And it reads, this license lets others distribute, remix, tweak, and build upon your work, even commercially, as long as they credit you for the original creation. So it specifically says what people can do with the data, um, who can do it, and if they need to credit you or give you that attribution. Uh, okay. And for looking at data licensing, here are some resources where I recommend you start. The first is Creative Commons. Creative Commons creates a lot of licenses and they're very popular around the world. And they also have really nice um, descriptions that are understandable by humans that are not lawyers. So that's helpful. And then we also have um, this link, Open Definition Licenses, and a link to some US government licenses, and which are useful in case you are working with government data. And I didn't find other government license links. Um, I'm in the US, so I'm a little bit biased. But those exist as well. And yes, I recommend checking out these links. And I'm not going to tell you about more licenses because there's not enough time. I could talk about data licensing for like an entire day, but we are going to move on. All right, we're gonna talk about data management plans. These are plans that tell you, you know, what you're gonna do with your data and how you're going to use your data. And they're usually written before you start collecting data and they are often required by funders. And so they ask questions like, how are you collecting the data? What type of data are you collecting? Are there any ethical or privacy concerns? Like, are you working with human data? Is the data in a proprietary format? And if it is, maybe it should not be. Um, how will you release the data? How long will the data be maintained or hosted after it's released? What's the license? And all of this is about making the data more fair. And then here are two quick resources for making data management plans. One is a paper, 10 simple rules, and the other one is a data management plan online tool that will help you create it. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about is publishing your data, AKA making your data useful. And the first thing I wanna talk about when I talk about making your data useful is making sure that you have recorded the metadata. So what is the metadata? It's the data about your data. It's things like, what is the license? What do column names mean? And what units were used? Um, it's important that you are keeping track of what is inside of your data so that you or future you will thank you. Um, also collaborators, anyone that is using your data needs to understand what's inside your data. Uh, the next thing that's important is to publish your data in non-proprietary formats. So for example, don't publish your data in an Excel document, publish it as a CSV file. CSV files can be used by all, any software, it's an open format. Where to publish? If you're at a university, I recommend looking at your institutional repository. And then there are also open repositories like Zenodo or Dataverse. Um, 
you can also publish your data when you publish a manuscript. There are some journals like eLife that actually let you link your raw data to the figure now when you publish, which is super helpful. And then also open access journals. And, you know, we could talk about open access journals, you know, for a day as well. But um, many open access journals let you publish data and will let you publish so that anyone can access your research for free. All right, quick example of why this matters, why open data matters. Um, I used to work on a project called the Reusable Data Project, where we were integrating biological data from various different databases. And we came across a lot of licensing problems. A lot of databases have really either no license or they have really um, closed licenses. And so it's hard to use the data. An example is WormBase, which is the definitive source for C. elegans data. If anyone has ever worked with C. elegans, then they've probably used WormBase. It hosts all sorts of data on them. And researchers really depend on WormBase to get their work done. But the WormBase license, they don't have a single license. Rather, they say that data users are instructed that they are responsible for identifying and complying with licensing and copyright restrictions for each piece of information in the database. So that means that each user of WormBase now is supposed to go in and check every single piece of data that's on WormBase that they want to use to check the license. And that's impossible. Like that, they, WormBase does not really want the users to do that. It's unenforceable and it's just not a good way to do this. So this is an example of why it's important to think about data licensing for your users. All right, I'm gonna end here by saying that, where can you learn more? If you're at a university, ask your librarian. They are there to help you and they're experts on this. Um, the project I work on, the Frictionless Data for Reproducible Research Project, we have tools where we will help you document your metadata, validate your data, and then publish your data. And then I wanna stop by saying that there is Open Data Day is on March 7th. So that's about to happen. And it is a worldwide day of events about open data. And it's not too late to join an event or host your own event. And so you can find a map of events at opendataday.org and um, join people working with open data. All right, and with that, I will stop. Thank you so much. I think you deserve an award for the timing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so we are one minute over, unfortunately. Um, just checking if we have any questions. Uh, scrolling down, scrolling down. We do, we have several questions. Uh, so what I'm going to do, um, if this is okay with everyone, is I'm quickly going to close out the call and anyone who wants to answer any questions or ask any questions, hang around. Is that okay? Okay, okay, right. Okay, so... Um, very quickly, we have some assignments uh, to get your project online. Um, so we did a GitHub session uh, last week. If you have any other questions, we have some links. So just take a check out at the end of the document um, to look at those assignments, uh, including trying to um, break down some of your project uh, milestones into smaller tasks to define a timeline and roadmap for your uh, project. Uh, and also to create a community contribution guidelines. Um, beyond that, please feel free to hop back down to our feedback, tell us what worked, what didn't work, and what you changed or what surprised you at the very end of the document. Um, did I miss anything, Malvika? No. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> right, so it's been lovely having you. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming and joining in and listening to our several great speakers. Um, and feel free to drop off now. In the meantime, I'm just going to go through the questions that we had for Lily. Um, okay, right, so we have a question here, rephrasing the facts versus copyrightable controversy from legal into philosophical level. Should data be creative work or not? I think that's a great question and I think, you know, we could debate that for a long time. Um, I personally am super into everything should be open, so I don't think it should be copyrighted, but, um, you know, that's just me coming from like a very, very open mindset. 
Okay, uh, next question. Uh, can we license the data if we don't own it or do we need to straighten that out with the university first? That is a great question. You will need to talk to your university most likely um, and I will tell you from experience it will probably be a complicated conversation. Um, but whoever you know, created that data or posted it in the first place probably has the license. And so I would even suggest talking to that person first before you talk to your university um, if you're trying to reuse somebody else's data. If you're creating your own data, then, um, then yeah, talk to the university. And it might be, you, it, if you're creating your own data and you are on a grant, then it's probably in your grant paperwork, it says the specifics about like your data copyright. Amazing, thank you. And a question from Christine. How do you find out how reusable your data actually is, e.g. whether your metadata is sufficient and understandable or whether your data format meets an open standards like bids for neuroscience that others can easily use, um, use or find tools for? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think if there's like a universal checker and I don't know if there is, but that's a really great idea if there isn't. Um, I think, you know, the onus is on you to do research, see are there standards in my field? So like you mentioned bids, which is a neuroscience standard. And then um, honestly, like if you're even creating metadata, like you are ahead of the curve. And if you're even using standards, like that's already really amazing. Um, I would say also you could test it. You could give that data set to a colleague and be like, do you understand this? Um, if, you're at a, if you're at a university or institution, ask your librarian, they will help you. Um, I know that there are some projects, like I think there's an R-based project, the language R, where they um, have code set up or a package set up where you can fairly straightforward rerun analysis and it will tell you if it repeated or found the same results statistically. So I think there is some work going on about like reproducibility in that sense. Okay, does anyone else have any questions or comments for Lily? Uh, so, uh, so I can unmute. I think that sounds like we're wrapped up. So thank you so much uh, for coming and presenting today, Lily. Um, it's been really interesting and great to hear about open data. And I think we will say, uh, have a great day. Have a great afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Lily. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.